Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna, Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of Living the Sunnah. And alhamdulillah, we are joined today by a very, very special guest who is also one of our Sunnah follower administrators, Sister Ayeen Lin. And she's the wife of Dr. Ibrahim Dramali, who's one of the scholars of our website. And she'll soon have her PhD in holistic medicine. And as part of preparing for Ramadan, she's here tonight to grace us with a great presentation as to how to have a healthy, holistic Ramadan. And with that said, I'm going to now turn this over to Sister Ayeen Lin. Okay, and there you go, Sister Ayeen. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I'm so happy to be here as part of your Living the Sunnah series and Ramadan prep. So the title of this talk is How to Have a Healthy and Holistic Ramadan. And it's really a topic, health in general is a topic that's very near and dear to me. Because as Muslims, I feel like we are always so focused on our spiritual health and um, becoming more religious, but we sometimes neglect our physical health. And that's just as important. And that's why I like using the term holistic because we are, um, there are many different parts to, to us. You know, we have our culture, we have our emotions, we have our physical health, we have our spirituality, and all of that makes up who we are. So um, first I'd like to just make a dua, Allahumma baligna Ramadan, oh Allah, let us reach and see the blessed month of Ramadan all of us inshallah so when we're talking about healthy ramadan you know why why do we consider why would we even consider having a healthy ramadan so let's talk about what health is health bottom line our health is our wealth without our health we would not we we wouldn't have anything like what's the value of having a long life if we're not going to be healthy. We can't enjoy it if we have a poor quality of life. If we can't enjoy time with our kids, if we can't do a simple thing like walk, you know, a few steps, walk for 15 minutes. And when we are in our body that Allah gave us, it's in a manner for us. When we're in our body, if we're healthy and we're strong, we can therefore have a stronger spiritual Ramadan. Because the goal of Ramadan is really to unlock our full potential. We want, we know the, all the rewards of Ramadan, but, and we want to maximize all of our rewards. There are people who are unhealthy, who cannot pray tarawiyah. They cannot pray even at home, you know, regularly, they have to sit down. Um, some people can't fast, you know, and I'm not saying anything about people's health conditions, you know, because it is what it is. These are sometimes these are just people's realities. But sometimes, you know, we can do things to control our health. We can take care of our health better. And that's what the focus of this talk is going to be on. So what does it mean to be healthy? Um, so first off, healthy is not uh, some weight loss fad diet because a lot of people seem to think that being healthy is synonymous with losing weight. And there's nothing wrong with losing weight, but weight loss or being thin does not automatically mean that you're healthy. There are plenty of people who are in a larger body that are very healthy. And there are plenty of people who are in a smaller body who are very unhealthy. So weight loss and um, Ramadan and being healthy, they're not always synonymous and healthy is also not perfection we're not perfect we don't have the perfect life we don't have the perfect diet we don't have the perfect resources it's it's a process 
Okay, and more, more importantly than all that, healthy is not a burden. Health and nutrition should not ever feel like a burden. If it feels like a burden in your life, then something is not being done correctly. Either it's not being propagated correctly or we don't have the right awareness about it. But health is, is just a beautiful blessing and it should, you should be able to insert it in your life however your life is. So what being healthy is, is just about feeling our best self. We, feel, we should feel great. We should feel optimal. And health is holistic, as I mentioned, because it's not just about one part of our health. There are some people who are always praying and always making da, but there's, they have you know, high blood pressure and they don't take care of their, of their physical health. That's not complete health. That's not holistic. And there are some people who, um, who are in great physical health, but they don't pray. You know, they're not, they don't have the relationship with Allah. That's not holistic health either. And health is also personalized. Because what's healthy for one person and what's balanced for one person could mean something totally different to somebody else. So health is all the different parts that make us who we are. And um, we should also individualize that and honor your, your, our own specific situations. So Ramadan is a great, unique month of blessings. This is the only month where um, we're kind of, everyone understands, there's universal understanding that, okay, I'm going to stay away from this for a while. Or I'm going to be doing a little more of this for a while. I'm going to be reading extra Quran. I'm not going to be actually, you know, watching movies that much this month. Or It's just understood. There's a big focus on our spiritual health. It's a time of self-reflection. -refle it's a time where we refrain from certain things. And at the same time, when we were refraining, we are also adding, we're, you know, we're adding extra good deeds, extra worship, um, extra charity and things like that. So fasting is not the same thing as starvation. Some people, you know, they think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to starve. You know, this is the month of starving. Starvation is not intentional. You know, most people in general do not intentionally starve themselves. And when you starve, you're, when, when someone goes through starvation, usually the physical, like physiological effects of starvation are not seen until like maybe three days, three days and more. We fast only for a part of the day. Okay. And we are intentionally refraining from food and drink. And there's a whole purpose for that. So fasting is kind of like a buzzword now. You know, we hear a lot in the um, secular world about intermittent fasting, and there's many, many different types. And there's a lot of different um, benefits for fasting. So that's why it's becoming more of a trend right now. But um, our fast is different. Um, so these are just some of the health benefits of fasting. It can help someone with cardiometabolic disease, like hypertension, um, high cholesterol, um, lipidemia, any kind of cardiovascular diseases. It can help with diabetes. It can help with fatty liver disease. It can help with inflammation, like with certain cancers, with arthritis, with somebody's brain health, with their mental health, and also with digestion, if they have some kind of IBS symptoms. And it can also help with basically improving your metabolism. So if you have someone with obesity <clears throat> or um, it, it can be a form of a healthy kind of weight loss, um, so to speak. So these are all like the health benefits of fasting. And that's why it's getting so much um, attention in the media and in the world now. Um, but our fast, <clears throat> the Ramadan fast is different. So we are like, I always tell my colleagues, you know, when they speak about intermittent fasting, I'm like, well, you know, Muslims are like the OGs of intermittent fasting. We've been doing intermittent fasting, you know, since the Prophet Sallallahu told us about it. So um, when I first became a Muslim, I was, um, intermittent fasting was not really popular. So 
you know, I had people around me, my family, my friends and stuff like, oh, you, you know, what do you mean you're not going to eat? It was just, you know, you're going to starve yourself. It's really just we're shifting. We're not starving ourselves. We're shifting the time and we're shifting our routine. So in the daytime, we, we're refraining from anything that's lawful, you know, food, drink, intimate relationships, some of our actions, some of our speech. We're just shifting our normal routine and we're shifting our mindset. And all of that is because we're trying to reach a higher level of Iman. We're, we're all, all of this re refraining actually makes us much more productive in our religion and physically too. So, <clears throat> and we feel, you know, maybe the first few days we might not feel the best because our body is adjusting, you know, to eating in a different time and, and we're staying up later for Tarawi and stuff. But we feel great, actually. And we feel great because when while we are refraining from those lawful acts during the daytime, number one, shaitan is locked up. And number two, we are really, we're suppressing our lower self, you know, our that criminal part of us, that our nafs, that part is being weakened. And we're reaching a higher level of iman because our soul, like the, the better part of us is being strengthened. So some of the scholars, they say that, you know, they, they kind of categorize the different levels of fasting. So the first level over here is basically just, we just change our eating schedule. This is like some people know it as the fast of the child. You know, like when you're trying to train your child to fast, you know, we'll ask them, oh, did you eat anything, you know, today? Did you fat? No. Oh, you did such a good job. MashaAllah. You know, they just... That's all they're doing. They're just controlling when they're eating, right? So if we as adults only do that part, we fulfill the fast, but that's considered like the lowest level of fasting, okay? The second level of fasting is, of course, we're controlling when we eat. We're not eating during daytime hours, but we're also controlling our body parts, you know, the way we use our body. Um, our, our, we're protecting our gaze, right? Our eyes, what we listen to. Um, our tongue, what we're seeing, and um, also, you know, what we're eating. Okay, so this is, some people might call it like the fast of the elite. The first one, the fast of the child, and the second one's the fast of the elite. And then the third one here is the highest level, and um, most of us are, you know, th th this is considered like the fast of the prophets and the righteous. You know, this is when they're actually taking it all the way up to another level. They're controlling their, their hearts and their mind, their thoughts. You know, so most of us here, we're, we're on this level, which is, which is fine. So I'm going to be focusing on how we control our body parts here. So the fasting of the elite, what does it mean when we control our body? You know, we're protecting what we're looking at. We're protecting all our limbs, um, how we use our, our eyes, how we use our ears. If we're not backbiting, maybe we're listening to backbiting, right? Um, where we go with our limbs, what we're doing with ourselves, okay? And part of that also, we need to protect our stomach. And what I mean by that is that we have to, because our stomach is, is an organ, you know, it's an organ that's made up of human tissue cells that Allah gave us. We have to honor that because um, how do we honor that? We honor that by making sure that we are putting quality food in our stomach and that we are following the sunnah of moderation because Islam is a sunnah, is, is a religion of moderation. And we are making sure that we're not eating too much. And you might be like, oh, what are you talking about, Annie? You know, we're fasting all day. We're going to want to eat a lot. Of course. Yeah. But remember that Ramadan is a month of fasting, not a month of feasting. Okay. Because that's where all the problems come in. Feast, we wait for the eat. Ramadan is the month of fasting, not the month of feasting. So while we're doing all these things, controlling our body, and this is not easy, you know, protecting all of our limbs and our organs and then protecting our stomachs is not easy. It's a struggle. Um, we're, we're like, we, we got out of our routine. So while we're out of our routine, we're forming new habits. While we're forming new habits, it's easy to break out of the old habits because we're already out of schedule. 
we, we're doing something totally different, living our life differently um, in these 30 days. Okay, so for the quality of the food, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the interpretation of the meaning that um, eat of what Allah has provided for you, which is lawful and good. And be grateful for the favor of Allah if it is indeed Him that you worship. So the Arabic here is halalan tayyiban, which translates to lawful, which is halal and good. So Allah separates and distinguishes the difference between something that's halal and something that's tayyib. Tayyib actually is, um, is more than good, it's pure. So we can have Coca-Cola and Skittles, for instance, that's halal, right? But is it tayyib? Allah is telling us, and there's another ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah where he also distinguishes um, halal and tayyib. We want to put in our body what is halal and what is tayyib. So Allah provided it for us, right? Can we call some of the things that we're eating food? You know, is it really natural? Or is it some kind of chemical science experiment with ingredients that you can't even pronounce? Because what we put in our body is supposed, is meant to nourish us. And what we're eating either is going to nourish us or is going to not nourish us or basically make us sick. So Allah is already telling us that we need to honor our health and our stomachs by looking at quality of food. Allah also tells us about moderation. Okay, all children of Adam, take your adornment at every masjid and eat and drink, but do not be excessive. Indeed, he does not like those who commit excess. So we know we're not supposed to participate in um, being excessive in like, you know, shopping or hoarding things or things like that. But notice how in Surah Al-Araf, Allah puts adornment in the masjid, like our clothes and food and drink together, but don't be excessive. Okay, and he does not like those who commit ex excess. And we're, we're all guilty of this. You know, we live in a very different time right now. We have many, many options. We have all kind of variety in stores and now we don't even have to go anywhere. We can just, you know, Uber Eats and all these kind of things that, that bring the food to us. And we have um, preferences, we have addictions to food, we have all kinds of things. But if it's one thing that we learn in Ramadan when we're eating a little bit less, we don't really need that much. Because when we, after Ramadan is over, when we try to eat, you know, that big plate of food, we, we can't because our body accommodated and adjusted and our stomach shrunk a little bit. And um, we realized that we don't really need to eat that much. And the last way to honor our stomach is um, with the quantity of food. So there is a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, the son of Adam cannot fill a vessel worse than his stomach. And it is enough for him to take a few bites to straighten his back, which means, you know, we don't need to eat that much. But if you cannot do that, then he may fill it with a third of his food, a third of his drink, and a third of his breath. So basically, you know, we the prophet وسلم, is telling us we really do not need a lot of food to sustain ourselves um but most of us we can't you know we don't live that simply where we just take a few bites right so really our stomach is just an organ that's a little bit bigger than our fist and we should have if we're following the sunnah right a third of our stomach for food a third for drink, and you leave the last third for, for your breath and um, for your energy, basically, because we've all been there where we're overeaten. And how do you feel? You've got, you know, what, 
we used to say the itis, you know, you, you can't get up, you're tired, you're sluggish, you know, you lay down, you don't feel good, you're just, you're done, you know, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't put ourselves in that position. So we, you leave that third for your energy so you can worship because really we're here, Allah gave us his body so we can worship him. Okay, now the stomach is the worst vessel to overfill as the Prophet Sallallahu told us, why is that? Now we don't need scientific evidence to confirm what we know from the Quran and the Sunnah, but um, scientifically, our health is in our stomach and our intestines. Our immune system is in our gut. 70% <clears throat> of our Im immunity, at least 70% is in our gut. Our happy hormones are made in our gut. Serotonin is made in our gut. So when you honor your stomach, you honor your gut, you're actually protecting your health. So during the Ramadan fast now, um, our, as we're refraining from all these things, our desires are tested, our willpower is challenged, but our resolve is, is unshaken. You know, we always get people who are like, not even water, not even a sip. And, you know, maybe the first few days, you know, it's a little hard, but after that, it's, it's so easy. We don't really struggle too much, you know, after we get into the swing of things. You know, we, we have good resolve during the fast. And if you go to work while you're fasting by, you know, the next week, by the first week or the second week, they even forget that you're fasting. It's after the fast, that's the real challenge. Okay, so again, we, we have desires that are being tested. It's still Ramadan, it's just after the fast and our willpower is challenged. But do we have that same resolve? You know, are we able to stick with our healthy habits? You know, if, if we weren't like watching things um, aimlessly during the daytime, during the fast, because we're focusing on Quran, do we just suddenly, you know, after the, the, the fast breaks, do we just suddenly start watching all kinds of movies? No, we don't do that, you know, but do we stay as strong with those habits with the food? You know, um, we like I know some people, they don't like to talk on the phone with their friends during the daytime because they don't want to make a mistake. They don't want, you know, to hear um, backbiting or, you know, whatever the case is. But they might do it a little bit in the nighttime because they feel like, OK, I'm, I'm not fasting now. You know, I can listen to what you have to say, um, but they don't really go overboard. But with the food, it's a little bit different. OK, we kind of like we open that door for the food. And, and this is all of us, we've all been there. So Ramadan symptoms, um, some of the symptoms that are the majority of the complaints uh, is not really hunger. It's really about energy and headaches and feeling sluggish and saying, oh, my body is shut down because I'm fasting. So, and so that's not really true um, because if you look at Islamic history, there were some great major events that happened in Ramadan. The Battle of Badr and the conquest of Mecca both occurred during Ramadan. Okay, how, how can the Muslims or anybody have these kind of events with lack of energy and headaches and being sluggish? It's, it's not really feasible. It's really because we have to look at during the window, eating window, the time frame of when we can eat, what are we eating during that time and how are we eating? Because that determines how we're going to feel when we're fasting. You know, it's, remember, it's just a time shift. If you eat something, if, and without being Ramadan, if you eat something that um, is really greasy, let's say, and you eat a lot of it, the next day you're not going to feel good because of what you ate the night before. So it's the same thing. Whatever we're eating when we are not fasting, is going to affect the way we feel the next day. So part of this um, is also because it is a chronological time, chronobiological time, because we're eating later. And maybe if you're not used to eating later, some of it, you, you it does take your body some time to adjust. So we will have these, um, a headache or something like this, right? Or you may be having a caffeine withdrawal or, or, or what have you. 
but the majority of it is, you know, we, we can, our body is very smart. Our bodies can adjust. If we take care of how we're eating and what we're eating while that time frame that we can't eat, these symptoms wouldn't have, wouldn't be here. Okay, so now um, the fun part, talk about food, okay? So how, how can we eat? How can we nourish ourselves? So we're only eating at suhoor and iftar and in between, okay? Meaning in between the iftar and suhoor time. Water hydration is so important. Our cells cannot function without water. You know, our blood, water becomes our blood. Water becomes a medium where it carries all the nutrients and vitamins and minerals all throughout our bodies. You know, we, our body's made up of so much water. We need water. So in general, we should be getting about half your body weight in ounces of water. For example, if someone is 200 pounds, they should be getting about a hundred ounces of water in general. You know, just there's a lot of things that um, can be personalized, but this is just like a, a rough estimate. Okay, and in a, like a one glass of water, like a cup of water is about eight ounces. So there's many ways you can get this in. You know, we're not starving, remember? We're just shifting the time that we're eating. So you can get it either um, straight by just drinking water straight. And this is just an example of how to get um, one, two, three, four, five, six, between six to nine cups in. You know, you can drink a cup before Sahur time. You can drink a cup after Sahur. Um, then a cup while you're breaking your fast. And it always feels so good when you break your fast and you drink that water and you just feel it coming down. And then uh, one or two cups um, during the iftar or after the iftar. And then one or two cups during tarawiyah. And if you go to the masjid, you can bring, bring that water in a bottle. And then you can drink another few cups before bed. And that's already like one, two, three, four, five, six. So 648 ounces. Or if it's nine, that's 72 ounces. You know, and then you adjust it according to your need. Okay. And some people, you know, love to drink water straight. Some people, not really. They, you know, they don't really like it. So there's other ways to get your water in. You can do water infusions, and I'll show you some examples. You know, you can take um, some herbs or some fruit and just put it in the water and let it infuse in the water um, for an hour or two. And the water I used to take um, when I had a garden, I used to take mint fresh mint from the garden and just put a whole bunch of mint in the water and it would just be minty water. And it, it, you, it was so refreshing. Or you can take some lemons, limes, you can take watermelon and put it in there, watermelon and mint together. You can do rosemary, you can do ginger, you can do orange slices, you can do cucumber, you can do so many things with water infusions. You can also, um, herbal teas count all kind of herbal teas, kerkade, um, which is hibiscus, uh, any kind of herbal teas counts, and then decaffeinated beverages. And I put decaffeinated, uh, caffeinated beverages can count too. However, caffeine tends to be like a diuretic. Um, it'll make you urinate more. So you end up losing water uh, a little more. So if you're going to include ca caffeinated drinks like coffee or caffeinated tea, then you just need to make sure you're getting uh, a little bit extra water. Okay. And another way you can get your water intake in is through fruits. There are some fruits who are, that are really, that have a lot of water content, you know, like watermelon uh, or oranges and some vegetables like cucumbers and also soups. Soups are so nourishing, nourishing and it, it's a water base. So this is um, plenty of ways for, you, for us to get our water in. These are some examples of infused water and it looks pretty to the eye. So when you see it, it just makes you wanna drink it. If you have kids or a, or a spouse, you can get creative you know, and work on it together. Maybe one day the kids will do make their infusions. Another day, you know, the the parents will do their infusions, and then you see what you like. But there's so many different ways 
um, to infuse water. It looks pretty and um, it gives it a little bit of um, a flavor. And some of the nutrients do come out in, in, in the water too. So you get the added benefit of the nutrients inside the water. Another drink is called Nabid. And this is what this is one of the Prophet Sallallahu's favorite drinks. Um, he basically used to take some dates or raisins and he'd soak them. Soak them in water. And um, like I think he would soak it in Fajr time and then drink it for Isha time, or the opposite, soak it in Isha time and drink it for Fajr time. But this is very energizing because dates, um, they have carbohydrates in them and uh, a lot of minerals. So it all comes out into the water. So it gives the water this like sweetness and you're getting those minerals in there and it's very rejuvenating. It's very delicious. I was actually going to make it yesterday to, sh um, to show you guys what it looked like, but I forgot, sorry. Okay, so... So Suhoor. So I'm sure that Sister Layla had gone over all the blessings of Suhoor. Okay. Um, bottom line is there are blessings. There are blessings in Suhoor time. And some people are not really hungry in Suhoor time. I'm one of those people. Sometimes I am hungry. Sometimes I'm not hungry. But because I know that there is blessings in Suhoor time, I will at least have my water. Always, I always drink water um, at Sahur time, at the least. Or I'm having uh, a nice breakfast if I'm hungry, or I'm having leftovers from the night before. Okay, so Sahur is really important because remember, um, yes, we're supposed to be eating a little bit less because we're supposed to be taming our desires, but we still have to nourish ourselves. We still have to make sure that we're getting in that time frame that we're used to sleeping during that time, that we are getting all the nutrition and the nourishment that we need so our bodies can run effectively and efficiently so we can worship a lot more. So if you're one of those people who don't really like to eat as soon as you wake up, then one little hack you can do is wake up a little bit earlier. You know, instead of just like waking up, okay, there's um, 10 minutes left, you know, uh, I, but I don't feel like eating. But then you'll be hungry maybe, you know, an hour or two later. Get up maybe an hour earlier, you know, and prepare something. And because once you get up and, and you start moving around, then you'll get, you know, you'll, you'll give your body a chance to actually welcome food in your system. And there are so many different websites online where you can look at um, to get some ideas and inspiration for um, Sohor recipes. This is just one that I found. Um, basically, you want to be looking at protein, something that's the higher in protein, not so much carbs um, only because carbs will make you go up and down on a roller coaster and then it's gonna, you're going to get hungry you're going to crash if you're eating only carbs so you want to get some protein because the protein will make you stay full you'll feel full because it takes our body longer to break down protein than it does for carbs carbs we break it down fast that's why when we're eating potatoes or rice we're hungry an hour later because we break it down too fast unless it's like a complex carb you know, like sweet potato or something where it takes the body a little bit longer to break it down. But the protein will actually keep us more feeling full and our body needs protein. We, we need protein to, for, for everything. Every cellular function that we need, it needs protein. It may, needs protein to make our DNA, it needs protein to make new cells, it needs protein to break down for enzymes, enzymatic reactions. Um, we need protein. Also fats, um, a healthy fat like coconut milk, chia seeds. You see over here, these are like overnight, overnight oats. You have um, oatmeal, which is um, protein and a fiber. And you can add coconut milk or almond milk. And um, that's a healthy fat. So the fat and the fiber 
and you can add protein in there too from chia seeds and also fruit. So that's, this is a nice balanced meal. You'll, this, this can keep you full. So, and of course, these are just examples. Everyone has their own preferences and everyone has their own cultural foods. So um, I always uh, want to honor that, you know, stick. This is not like, okay, this is not the only way to be healthy. There are every culture has healthy foods. Some people, you know, eat beans. Some people eat that a five course meal in sahur time, you know, and their iftar time is very light. Eggs are a nice source of protein and some vegetables. The only thing I would say is just try to get your veggies in um, because veggies are really important. This is another example, another website. Um, so some cultures, they, you know, they like their hummus and their chickpeas and different kind of cheeses and stuff. This is all fine. It's just, you know, if you're just gonna only eat just bread, for instance, which is just a straight carb, um, it's not really balanced. So just try to balance everything with your proteins, your fats, your veggies, and that, that should be able to sustain you, inshallah. And also remember fruits and veggies can be hydrating too. So get your fruits in there. And you know, another benefit of waking up a little bit extra early is that you're not trying to chow everything down. Like, oh no, I got, you know, 10 minutes. I got, I'm trying to eat all this. You're gonna have a stomach ache, you're gonna have indigestion. You know, you wanna be able to eat mindfully and peacefully because you know, the purpose of your eating is not just for pleasure, but you're nourishing the body that Allah gave you. So now it's time for iftar. So how can we have a nourishing iftar? Uh, remember the sunnah is to be moderate. And as we went over, we're supposed to have quality and the right quantity. So this is how, when you have your plate of food, I want you to think about moderation, okay? So your cultural foods are okay. A lot of the traditional foods, especially in the masjids are like fried samosas and, um, pakoras and things like that, delicious, right? But um, if we're going to break our fast on that and then we're gonna eat two or three of them um, at that time and we do that every single day in Ramadan, that's a lot of fried foods. So enjoy it if that's your thing, but be moderate, maybe stick to one, you know? Um, and of course, remember the quality foods. We have to just remember, this is halal, but is it tayyib? Just be mindful about what you're feeding your stomach. And then the quantity, which seems to be um, a big, uh, the biggest problem, the portion, con the portion control. How do we make sure that we're not eating, um, overeating? Uh, you know, remember, we want to leave that third of for food and third for drink, and the last third we want to leave for our breath or for worship. So, one way to control our portion is um, after we break our fast on dates, right, or fruit or water or a soup, which is really a nice way to break your fast. That's it. If you, I mean, dates are carby and high in sugar, but it'll give your body the carbs and the sugar it needs um, for that moment. And it'll signal our body like, okay, there's food coming in my system after I, I we've been fasting for 13, 14, 17 hours, wherever, wherever we live. Let your body get that signal. It takes time for your body to like kind of reconcile all of that. Okay. And then you go pray. And then you come back and you eat your iftar. Because if you just sit down and you start chowing down right away, you're going to overeat. You know, think about it when we're at a restaurant and we're hungry and we're just ordering and ordering. The more time we have, the more we're ordering. And then the food comes and it's too much. But if we were to just take our time and eat just a little bit, and, you know, while we're waiting for the rest of the food to come, because sometimes, you know, I'll go to a restaurant and we'll have appetizer and it'll take so long for the entree to come. But by the time the entree comes, because we already done ate like three different appetizers, we're already full. We can't, we don't have the room for that, you know, so we end up taking it home. But if it was to all come at once, we, this is how we fall into the trap of overeating. 
So a good practice is just to break your fast on something light and then go and pray and, you know, just pray with intention and with, with um, gratitude that alhamdulillah, I made it through this day. Alhamdulillah, it's Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, I was able to make dua all day. Inshallah, I'm one of the people that Allah freed from the hellfire. You know, Allah gave me this because when you break, when you're fasting all day long and then you, you, you take that bite, you drink that sip of water, it is so good. Alhamdulillah. Okay, another thing. So now when you're sitting down on the table um, <clears throat> to eat, try to eat a variety of colors. Try to eat the rainbow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us so many beautiful colors. I don't know why that's blue, but it should be purple. Purple foods are great for the brain. Green foods are great for the heart and the immunity and for detoxing. You know, white foods also. Orange foods are great for the skin and for fertility. You know, red foods are great for the heart. There's so, and then the beautiful thing about um, colorful foods, they're, um, the scientific term is called phytonutrients. They all, every food has sometimes a mixture of colors in it, but you only see one color, right? Like those leaves that fall in the fall time. Um, they're green, but then when they're breaking down, you see red and orange, you know, because they have different, different colors. Every food is a different superpower. Every color, I mean, is a different superpower. So every color has a benefit. And this is how Allah created the food for us all around. And the beautiful thing about this is that when you combine the colors, it has synergy. The powers increase like exponentially. So when you're eating your reds and the greens and the purples together, it has more phytonutrients and superpowers than it would if you're just eating the reds by itself. So I just want you to try to be mindful about what colors do you normally eat and what colors do you not normally eat? So when you're going to the store, you say, you know what? I don't really eat a lot of purple foods because you know I don't really see them a lot. Um, pick up something purple, you know, purple cabbage, the purple potatoes, purple carrots, purple cauliflower, you know, purple kale. There's different things you can try and just maybe add a different color to your plate um, once a day, you know, once a day, one, once a meal or um, a few times a week. Just try to do that. These are some examples. And you want, if you have kids, you want your kids to eat in color too. Um, because the best thing you can give to your children is, um, well, one of the best things is, is health. You know, teaching them skills to be healthy so that they can go on and, you know, worship Allah with, with good manners and everything. So these are some examples, you know, kids love like um, fruit kebabs, um, I did a project with my students and they were in sixth or seventh grade at that time. Um, it was a rainbow food project and uh, had them come up with, you know, their own creations. So they were doing everything from smoothies to this, to that. And some of them never ate something green, never ate something purple, never, you know, saw things, something that looked weird, but they tried it and they liked it. You know, and because they made it themselves or they prepared it themselves um, and their family ate it, uh, they took pride in it. They liked it, you know, so it's just um, I mean, we're not expecting us to change our dietary habits overnight, but, you know, this is a start. OK, now <clears throat> the other way to follow the sun of moderation and the portion control, um, there's two ways here. And everyone is different, so you choose the way that works for you. The first way is something called intuitive eating, and I'll go over what that is. And the other way is the plate method. So it just depends what, um, what works for you, okay? Uh, I forgot to mention in the presentation that um, a couple of years ago, uh, my family, we changed our plates. You know how we you buy those plate sets and there's like the dinner plate, then the salad plate, and then the little like dessert plate. 
So human psychology, you're just going to eat whatever is given to you, you know, and then you don't want to waste the food. So if you have a big plate, you're going to put everything on that plate and you're going to eat the whole plate. So we basically change our dinner. We eat it on the salad, what was considered the salad plate, that medium sized plate. And we, we show that up, you know, sometimes when we have guests, you know, we will go to the, the dinner plates and that's okay because remember everything is not perfect. And it's more about your, your dietary pattern overall than what you're doing all the time. Okay. So the plate size can help a lot. Um, so intuitive eating is basically being in tune and being mindful about how you're eating and what you're eating and listening to your cues, listening to if, if you're hungry, if you're full, you know, you're just being very intentional and the plate method is something different. I'll go over them. So when you eat intuitively, um, first of all, you, you eat with intention. Like I'm not just going to sit down and grow up. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me this food. I'm going to use this food to nourish myself. And at the same time, it's not just for nourishment, but I'm going, you know, this is food that I enjoy. We love eating. We love breaking bread with our family, with our friends, with the community. You know, Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. And there's a lot that went into that plate of food that's in front of you from the way that it was grown, from the person who prepared it and packed it or grew it, how it got delivered to the, to the store and picked or whatever. There's so much there to be grateful for. So sit down and just think for a moment and just be grateful and eat with a beautiful intention. Uh, and then the second way to eat intuitively is uh, to, to plan in advance. So a lot of times we fall into the trap because we don't we don't really plan ahead. You know, we go to the we go grocery shopping when we're hungry and we've been all been there. What happens when you go shopping when you're hungry? You buy everything, right? Um, you sit down and you're ready to eat and you're, and you're choosing everything. You're, you're packing out everything on that plate. OK, um, so you want to be very mindful and intuitive about um, what you're planning to eat so one way is um, meal planning another way is just you know having a, a plan a program a schedule in your head what are we going to be eating how much food do i need do i need to buy all this food most of the time we don't okay the third way is to really sit down and chew our food i mean chew 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 there's a saying in the nutrition world chew your liquids and drink your food meaning we need to chew our food and break it down so well that it's basically almost liquid and i know it may sound nasty or you know some people um but you don't have to think about it like that just like because and maybe our parents told us this when we were little you know chew your food because if you just if you're just chowing down you're just taking you know three five bites and you're you're gulping pieces of meat down, you're you're going to have a stomach ache. That's because your stomach is already expecting you to do the work. That's why we have teeth. Your, your stomach is expecting to get the food that's already kind of broken down, not in big pieces. And that's why when we have a stomach ache, that's our stomach being mad at us. Like, OK, now I got all this extra work to do when you got teeth and you couldn't like break it down for me. OK, and so number one, it helps with digestion. Number two, when we're chewing and chewing and taking our time to really chew our food properly, we will start to feel full. We will start to uh, we'll start to be intuitive with when we're feeling full. OK, instead of just eating, eating, eating too fast and swallowing things without it being broken down, that is when we tend to overeat. The other tip, um, the fourth tip is to eat slowly, okay? And um, that goes with chewing also. We have to chew, make sure we're chewing it and then to eat slowly. We, you know, we sh I, I, I don't like to, when I'm in school, like when I'm teaching, I don't like to eat because I cannot eat slowly at school because there's always something going on. Like I can't, I don't feel relaxed. There's always something going on, the students, this or that. You know, I got planning and stuff like that. So I I can't, um, so I'll eat something very, very small, um, but I'll eat at home, you know, before I leave or when I come back. So just make sure that you're eating slowly. 
And then the last tip is to honor your hunger cues. We've lost touch with our with with um, our hunger cues. You know, sometimes we are full, but we're st we're still eating. You know, and sometimes we're hungry and we're not eating. So, and that's when that's another trap that we fall into. When we're hungry and we don't eat, we're not honoring our hunger cues. By the time we do sit down and grab something, we crash. We just grab the first thing that we want, that sugar, that that simple carb, because our body knows that's that's what's gonna give it the energy that it needs. So that's eating intuitively. That's one way. And the other way is the plate method. Um, I'm not crazy about, um, this is from Harvard, um, Healthy Harvard. I'm not crazy about it, you know, 110%, but it's um, because I feel like it should be more personalized, but it's better than the other plate method. I don't, I really don't like the other plate method by USDA. Um, this one is better. So some people, you know, they need something more structured to help them go into portion control and um, those kind of habits. So the plate method is basically making half of your plate plants, vegetables, and it should be vegetables and fruits. Fruits and vegetables, we're used to saying fruits and vegetables, but fruits are also a sugar. And yes, fruits are very good for you, but it, we can overdo it with fruits too. There are people who get fatty liver and diabetes from just ODing on fruits that they, you know, they buy crates and crates of it in Costco and, and they just eat too much. So we should be getting our vegetables and fruits and that should be about half the plate. And then the other half of the plate, a part of it should be that healthy protein. You have to always make sure you have some protein there, whether it's animal proteins or plant proteins. And then that other half, um, it can be some kind of a carb, some kind of grains, if you eat grains, um, healthy fats should be in there. And I don't know about everyone else, but the masjid where I am next to, when they serve the iftars, they, they just give you big, gigantic spoonfuls of rice and rice and rice, and then just a little tiny, tiny little bit of salad and you know some meat, and we end up eating the whole thing because that's what they gave us. And then we go for seconds, you know, so that's, that's really not balanced here. So this one is um, a good alternative for people who need that kind of structure. So Ramadan, um, the refraining, the adding, the spiritual high, the reaching the higher level of Iman, we can look at that as being like a Ramadan reset. You know, it is a really great chance for us to reset our habits, reset our health, and it's just 30 days, you know, and it's supposed to be um, starting around the second. And um, in these 30 days, we have a great opportunity to honor our health and to be more productive, you know, to really take a holistic approach to our health so that we can earn all of that Ajahn Ramadan, so we can stand up for Tadawi, so we can pray at, at, in the middle of the night, so we can make du'a, so we can go out and you know do more good deeds, so we can read more Quran with energy, without brain fog. And uh, with that, I will just ask you all to make the intention to have the healthiest Ramadan yet, and again, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let us reach the blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah. Oh, and that is the end of my presentation. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, Sister Ayin, this was just wonderful. It was just, just beautiful, subhanAllah. You know, may Allah bless you uh, for this presentation. I'm sitting here grinning from ear to ear. I took notes, I learned so much, subhanAllah, especially the different colors. I'm gonna go shopping tomorrow and get more purple. I don't have <laughs> enough purple in my life, subhanAllah. Yeah. And that's Most of us. You know, subhanAllah, so guys, any questions you all have for Sister Ayin, you know, go ahead. I'm sure we all do. Take the mic. Go ahead. And on Facebook, too. They're all saying accolades. My mother, 
accolades, Aine. <laughs> Home duty love, mom. Yeah, any questions or comments for Sister Aine? Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, go on. So much. It's okay, sister. You can go. I'm just wanna say thank you for everything. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. That's about what I was gonna say too. Thank you, Jazak about care. It it it's really it's really been ins more inspiring. I'm really looking, I was already looking forward to Ramadan and now even more because of uh, learning what you have taught us about food, because I do see a lot at mosque. It's, uh, there's a lot of rice and there's a lot of meat, but there's very little vegetables and, you know, and the colors. <laughs> like Sister Layla said, the colors too. I had never thought about the colors before now. So I want to thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Alhamdulillah. I have a question, Sister Ayeen. What about for a person like myself? I'm a bariatric, you know, surgery person. I can only eat. I basically live off of lean cuisine, you know, but um, lean cuisine. And like I always said, it's mostly the noodle stuff. You know, most of our stuff, I don't eat much meat because you know, I eat maybe one, I try to get, I'm supposed to eat at least two red meats a month. I'm lucky if I do one because I'm usually just lean cuisine, lean cuisine. What would you recommend for protein? Because I'm supposed to survive with protein and fruit and vegetables, protein and vegetables. Uh, what would you, uh, you know, recommend for a person like me? I can't digest potatoes. Yeah. I, can, I can eat rice now. You know, and I, I do try to add rice to my diet. But what yeah. else besides rice and lean cuisine for someone like me? Yeah, so with bariatric patients, um, because you had a part of the intestine cut off, the, the intestine is the major site of nutrient absorption. So I'm going to have to have a talk with you because we need to personalize a nice plan for you. Um, that means you're not getting a lot of B vitamins, you might be a little anemic, you know, I am. and yeah, and with B vitamins, you're not going to get a lot of energy. So um, I'll have a talk with you, you know, privately to see how we can personalize a nice plan for you. Yes, like I say, I'm on, I'm on vitamins. I take, I was getting the shots. I'm ta I take B, B vitamins. I am anemic. I'm so anemic. They was going to inject me with the uh, infusion, but I'm taking arm pills. They try me on these new arm pills. Yeah. We need to talk because I'm sick of a uh, lean cuisine. I just, I just, I can't do it anymore. I just want to eat and be happy eating, you know? Yes. Yes. And that should be our goal to in really enjoy our food and have a good relationship with food and, you know, not have to stress about being perfect. You know, so um, do you like soup? I love soup. I love soup. And I okay. do make that every now and then. Okay, that's great. Because that's a great thing to do. You can, I have a lot of nice recipes mm. to that you're going to get all the nutrients in there. It's called magic mineral broth. Oh, and wow. there's bone broth and there's all kinds of soups you can get in there. And you can, um, you can even put the meat in there in small pieces. Okay. So you can, yeah. So, but we'll talk. We'll yeah, talk because soups is what I is recommended for me. I usually, you know, if I, I'll take a switch from lean cuisine to the soups. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I need, I just, um, yeah, it's just, I don't have any joy out of eating. Anyone oh. else? Anyone else? Y'all, you everybody's in here all quiet. Fresno, this is your chance to ask her. Mm -hmm. Girl, I missed a lot of what she was saying, especially about the colors, because I had to go get my grandson. So um, uh, what were you saying about the colors, Aileen? I was saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a blessing with food with many, many different colors. And not only does it look beautiful and appealing, but every color has a different superpower. So like red foods are good for the heart, green foods are good for detoxing for the blood and orange foods are good for the skin and purple foods are good for the brain. So they each have something special about the colors. And when you combine the colors, they have synergy. So you basically, it's like powering up. So instead of having like 
X amount of vitamins and powers, when the, you would combine them together, it actually increases. And some foods have different colors in them, but we don't see them just like the colors of the leaves, you know, how they're green, but when they fall and um, they start to break down, you see all the different colors. So there's a lot of things that we can, um, there's a lot of benefits that are, uh, it's great for our health that are very, very abundant. You know, when COVID hit, in the beginning, um, all the shelves were, what was empty from the shelves? Chips and all kinds of junk foods, and it was full of vegetables. You know, so people were getting sicker, staying home, not being in the community, eating more junk food, not moving because they were isolating. And um, everything that Allah gave us, you know, was, was still there. So um, I was saying that try to add a different color, try to notice the colors that you eat and um, try to notice the colors that you don't eat. So try to add that color into, into work it into your meal plans. Okay. All right, Amina, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other comments or questions? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, sister. I have a question. Go ahead. So in our culture, we eat a lot of like rice, and it's not really brown rice. We don't ever cook brown rice. Ever since I was little, I never seen my mom cook brown rice. But we eat like basmati, um, white rice, and meat. Like usually, like here in America, they use rice as a side. But in our culture, rice is like the main dish. So, like, how would you recommend cooking brown rice? Because I tried cooking it, and it wasn't that great. You don't have to you don't have to eat brown rice if you're not into it. Brown rice can be more healthier for some people because it has the hull on top of it, so it has more fiber. Um, but it also has more arsenic, you know. So if white rice, like I'm Chinese, white white rice is a staple in my culture. We also eat white rice all the time. I don't eat it as much now anymore, um, but we also um don't it's not like a the huge portion of our plate. We have a little bowl, but we eat it all the time. Um, so I would don't you don't have to stay away from your cultural foods. You know, when I talk about healthy eating, I like to focus on what you can add, not what to take away, because no one likes to feel restricted and no one likes to be told that you know your cultural food is not healthy. Rice has is a partial protein. You mix it with beans. It's a complete protein. That's why rice and beans go good together. So what I would do is I would just add, just add, keep with your cultural foods and um, maybe just eat a little less of it and add. Because when you're adding all the different vegetables and the fruits and the different um, fibers and healthy fats, your stomach is just so big. So you're still enjoying your cultural food. You're not giving it up, but you're adding other nourishing foods too. Alhamdulillah. Uh, one of the uh, sisters here on Facebook said you mentioned uh, that too much fruit can be um, um, just as bad. She said, like, for example, is there a certain fruit that we need to watch how much we eat of? Yeah, so certain foods um, are have a very, very high sugar content, like uh, mangoes, and even dates, you know, um, so it'll make like my husband, he's a diabetic. And sometimes he gets hypoglycemic when his sugar drops, like when he's working out a lot, his sugar will drop. So if I need to pick up his sugar real quick, I'll give him half a date and it'll bring up his sugar 50 points in 10 minutes. That's how fast it is. So um, we shouldn't, we should not go crazy with those kind of fruits and just eat it because it's, it's, it's still sugar. It's a, it's a natural sugar. It's nature's candy. But if we're just eating sugar, sugar even though it's natural, you know, then that's where it stresses our body too much. And this is, can lead to problems like insulin resistance and diabetes and things like that. Okay. Another sister here asked on um, Facebook, she said, um, I'm trying to read it. She mentioned, she said the teas. She said, what if she likes to infuse her water with tea, but she wants, she uses Splendor. Is that okay? She says she can't drink just uh, tea and water without having a sweetener. So she uses Splendor. Is that okay? 
Yeah, so that's fine. If you want a sweetener, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with sweetening um, your drinks. Splenda is not my favorite, but um, <clears throat> because it's an artificial sweetener and there's a lot of associations with Splenda and um, chemical changes in the brain and things like that. So there's nothing really like 100% conclusive but there are natural sweeteners that you can use like monk fruit extract is natural um, stevia is also natural some forms of stevia are not the best um, but some people don't like stevia because it has an aftertaste um, xylitol is also uh, a natural option and sweetener and um, the new kit on the block is called allulose which is also natural so all of those do not raise your blood sugar and they're natural you if you want to um like cut down on your sugar content let's say um you can use um maple syrup you know honey it's still gonna break down in your body as sugar we still shouldn't be having a lot of it but um those are other options alhamdulillah okay sister norto go ahead assalamu alaikum sister and miss layla so for me, like, um, you know, our foods that we eat mostly, it's healthy food. You know, that's why you don't see a lot of big African people. But the thing with the food is the like the portion wise, because when we eat, we're eating a portion for like four people. So you're not just getting like, you know, one half cup of, you know, rice. And then they're getting like what, like it's the portion size is different from um, what you know Americans typically eat my question to that was um and I thought it was interesting when you mentioned about the color stuff like you know I never really noticed that the only whenever you said colors I, I thought of like home you know like you know depending on the colors you do your scheme of house it brings in so many different feelings you know so I thought that was very interesting I never really took um took heed to that but I am now like you know, looking like, you know, how purple is for like long, long, I can't say the word, but for like longer living and like red, like you says, for the heart. I thought that was very interesting. I'm gonna have to look into that because um, I'm like a public health major. So this is very interesting to me. Thank you so much. So my question to all of that was um, with the portion stuff, when you start cutting back on portion, is there any way like, you know, how your body cause sometimes like feeds off and stuff like that since it's so used to it. Is there any way like, do you just ignore that? Like, do you just, you know, just because sometimes, you know, your body, when it's used to something, it's always like longing for it. So what do we do in a situation like that? Yeah, so slow and steady wins the race. You know, when we go and we just make that drastic change, a lot of times um, we fall back. I mean, some people can do that. Some people, you know, like if they're, you know, in a bad habit, they can just stop cold turkey and just change. Um, but for the, in, in general, you know, slow and because you're right, your body is used to a certain uh, portion. So if you just suddenly just stop all of a sudden, <clears throat> um, your body's not gonna respond well. <clears throat> that's why it's good to ease into things. And that's why having a Ramadan prep is good. Even, you know, spiritually, you can't just like all of a sudden, you know, start doing that away. And you're like, we, we, you know, Sister Layla has been prepping and prepping and prepping. So we're, and even the month of Shaban, you know, we, we, it's a forgotten month because it's in between Rajab and Ramadan. We're trying to prepare ourselves to make um, our hearts soft and prepare our bodies and our minds and our souls. So slow and steady wins a race. And the good thing about culture is that culture always changes. You know, culture is always evolving. The culture of the Arabs once upon a time was killing their daughters, right? So, um, uh, and, and I'll go back to what I said before, um, when you're making changes to your dietary patterns, um, focus on what you're adding. So um, you want, if you wanna decrease your portion size, maybe add more fluids you know, drink a glass of water before you eat, because then you'll be more full. So then your body is not going to have be so, so much in the shock. And I'd also say make, and you said, you mentioned something about you eat for like four people, make the intention, you know, that you're, you're living the sunnah, right? The Prophet told us that the food for two people is enough for three. 
and the food for one is enough for two. So when you make that intention, like, you know what, this is my culture, but we all know that um, Sunnah is before culture, right? It's okay to have your, your cultural things, but um, we're all striving to live the Sunnah, especially here in Sunnah followers. So you make that intention, like, you know what, um, I've been eating like this for a long time and I'm used to it, but the sunnah, this is not really the sunnah. I want to follow the sunnah. So you start making that intention, asking Allah to help you and just ease into it. Just ease into it and focus on adding. Drink a glass of water before you eat. So you're not going to be as, as fun and, and slow down when you're eating, you know, and then maybe drink after you eat. So then your body's not going to be like, hey, something's missing. And that's, and that's great you're in public health because once you do this you can you can actually go and teach others you know um how to do this on a mass scale so that's great that you're in public health mashallah exactly uh sister Laylee wants to know which food is good for arthritis and joint pain arthritis and joint pain is a, a disease of inflammation so you want to make sure that you are not introducing so you i like to follow what's called the 4R protocol. You want to remove what is insulting your body. Because when you're, your body is hurting, that's your body's way of saying, I'm mad at you, something, something I don't like something. You know, I, I need to be honored. So inflammatory foods are things like sugar and wheat and dairy. Hmm. And um, then you want to introduce, you want to replace, because when you remove stuff, you want to replace it. So you want to introduce things that are anti-inflammatory and um, to bring the inflammation down. So you have things like turmeric, um, pineapple, any kind of digestive enzymes also, um, cinnamon. That is, and for some people, um, spicy food like peppers, for some people that works really well for them some people they don't so you have to really look and see what works for you but you have to get rid of the offenders you have to get rid of the offenders and just give your body a break doesn't mean you have to stay away from it forever but just i mean you didn't get the arthritis and joint pain overnight it's a it built up over time so you have to honor your body and give it that break for that amount of time also you know for some time a few weeks sometimes three months sometimes it takes a year you know, and it seems like a long time, but if you look at it this way, um, one year of staying away from certain foods and, you know, changing, you know, my program for a little bit, that one year is going to give me 50 more years of a quality of life. And it's so worth it. One year is nothing, especially if the arthritis took a long time to, to build up like that. SubhanAllah. And Sister Pamela wants to know, is keto good for weight loss? Keto can be good for weight loss for some people. It's not very sustainable by most people. And um, it has to be done in the right way. And uh, But it can also cause issues in some people. It can cause thyroid issues and uh, hormonal issues, especially in women. And um, I had my husband on keto for a while and he had lost 30 pounds, but I had to be very careful with the way I was doing it with him. And then after that, we transitioned to a lower carb because he had diabetes, but it did help his diabetes and it did help with some weight loss for him. Um, but I have seen people that did very poorly on it because remember we are individuals and we have different bodies, different biologies, different circumstances. So it doesn't work for everybody. SubhanAllah, mashallah. Any other questions? Did I get you, did I get you all on Facebook? I have one. Yeah, go ahead. I have about two. Okay. If you're craving sweets, what what does that mean, Aileen? And you talked about keto, the proper way to do it. What what do you, I'm not really clear on what you mean about that. What, what would be a proper way? Okay, so um, some keto diet, because keto is basically high fat, low carb, and depending on the version of keto, moderate protein. Um, I couldn't do that then. Pediatric. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Aileen. What about the, uh, the, uh, pro, uh, the uh, kicking, um, what is it called? 
you can drink it that shoots you into burning the fat quickly instead of uh are you do you know what i'm talking about um no but i have an idea so anything that promises quick results or ease is may work but it's not going to be sustainable and it might not be the healthiest way you know we have to look at um our health as a process and we have to go into it so you know it shouldn't feel like a burden because when you feel when when we go into these kind of um diets and we feel so restrictive restricted uh, we we most of the time the diets don't work because it'll work for that period of time and then they go back to eating the way that they were eating before and they gain all the weight back so that means the diet didn't work and then and it's very predatory these diets especially people who are kind of sell programs and stuff because they bank on that and then it ends up blaming the person well you didn't have the willpower we, it's not about the willpower you know it's about uh, like learning how to change your habits slowly and you start that by doing what's easiest for you you know just think about it like dawa someone who's like drinking smoking dating whatever and they become a muslim they can't just stop all that overnight and be perfect they're gonna you know they might slip up so you you ease them in, you ease them in, and they do what's easiest for them, so it can be sustainable. You know, so it's the same thing with that with with diets. So I don't like um, diet culture. I do not follow any kind of diets. Um, like I don't promote it. Sometimes diets are helpful for some people therapeutically, like if they have like a certain condition, but still they have to be working with someone to make sure that they're doing it right. And going back to your first question about how to do it right, keto, because it's high fat, um, bacon and butter is high fat. And if some people, and I've seen this, I've seen people sell this program where they just, they have a meal plan and they're eating bacon and butter every single day. That's not proper keto proper keto would be eating the healthy fats and um a lot of vegetables making sure that you have a lot of phytonutrients in there and then the right amount of protein for your goals so it has to be personalized one diet is not going to work for everybody everyone has different needs we have different biologies we have different preferences you know um, and our body will respond differently what works for me and what, for instance, my husband, when he was on keto, I did it with him for a while just to support him because he was like, you know, he went through a lot with his transplant and everything, but I had to have totally different adjustments um, because I wasn't feeling good and diets aren't supposed to make you feel sick. You know, health shouldn't make you, it should not feel like a burden. You should be loving it. You know, it should make you feel better. If it's not making you feel good and you're feeling like, you know, too restricted and or I feel like a failure, then something's not right. And it's a big industry. Diet culture is a huge industry. And then it ends up putting the blame back on the person. And um, it's just a very vicious cycle. Yeah, but I missed the part about craving sweets. If you told me I didn't hear. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, I forgot about that. So you're craving sweets um, could be for different reasons. So sweet is one of the five flavors and sweetness is comfort the breast milk is the first milk is the first food that we eat that we're exposed to and it gives us comfort you know it's sweet breast milk is sweet when you're craving sweets it could be for several reasons it could be because um we ate a lot of carbs and then we'll just crave sweets because you know our body goes in that roller coaster because carbs especially simple carbs like wheat and anything with sugar or breaks down to sugar um our body breaks it down like we break it down really fast our sugar goes up and then it goes down and then because we're crashing our body's going to want something real quick and sugar is that quick picker upper so our body will because that's one reason another reason is we're not getting enough protein um protein slows everything down because our body breaks down simple carbs very fast and it breaks on car um, fats um so so 
and it breaks down protein, it takes a longer time to break down protein. So we need to balance our meals. So I'm not saying you don't need to, uh, don't eat sugar. You can eat sugar. I eat sugar, I eat cake, chocolate, you know, but balanced, you know, um, there are days that I'll just have, you know, cake and um, piece of chocolate. Um, but then I'll, I'm, I'm craving it again in another hour. I'm like, let me get another piece of chocolate. You know, sometimes that happens. So, but when you balance everything out, you, you'll, you'll see that you want, you're not, you're not going to be craving the sugar. Inshallah. So what is a uh, crab in, um, that's what I've been eating, like a crab salad and a kale salad. That's what I had today. And I'm sitting here wanting me a sugar cookie. That's what I want, but I don't want to go get it. You know, I'm just craving something sweet. Every time I go in the kitchen, it's like I should make them sugar cookies, but <laughs> should I drink? <laughs> did you make the crab salad or did you buy it? It was, it was about it. Okay, so take a look at the ingredients. Um, because what they do is sometimes it's hidden sugars in like the mayonnaise and stuff, or like the dressings and the creams. And that, um, because sugar makes things taste good. Okay. Girl, it don't taste good. It's nasty. It ain't enough in there. It ain't. <laughs> it ain't. I'm just telling you straight up. But okay, I'm listening to you though, Amy. <laughs> yeah, well, take a look at the ingredients. And you, and you know, looking at labels and ingredients is life changing because you want to you want to know what you're putting in your body. And believe me, there are people with a job um a title. They are called flavor scientists. Okay? Their sole job is to sit there in their lab and to put ingredients together to make sure that that food is going to make you keep coming back for more. That's going to wow. be so palatable. Yes. And it's very, very intentional. You know, why do we have a Starbucks every few miles, you know, but like a farmer's market or Whole Foods, you got to search for one. And it's very intentional how they have all those macchiato, mochiato, all these kind of drinks next to the muffins and the this and the that, because com combined together and looking at that together, it's, you know, it's, we get hooked. And then we have all the fast foods, you know, we didn't used to have fast food restaurants on every corner back in the days, but now it's everywhere. But we also have a lot of health conditions now. So it's not our fault. You know, it's we we're kind of being our taste buds are being hijacked. So reading labels is the start just just and I teach it to my students. You know, I don't want to tell them what to do what to, because they're still kids. But like when I was growing up, I had real food. Right. I had real food. Um, these kids now, all they know is like Takis and the, that that's all they know. They don't, you know, some of them don't even know what, like they, they've never even tasted a green before. They don't know it. And they have all these colors, all these chemicals. And a lot of the chemicals that are allowed here are banned in other countries because other countries care about the health of their citizens because it's going to hurt their economy if their citizens are sick, right? But here it's it's profit. So just start by you know looking at re reading the label. Okay, look, if I'm craving too much, I could go make me a hamburger and that could change it and drink some water, right? That should that should be. Would that help? <laughs> that would definitely help. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, so a person like me who can't hold protein or stuff because of my bariatric just recently, and like I told you, I haven't had a steak in a while or no, no meat, and I've been craving sweets. So that's probably why I'm craving sugar and I can't eat sweet because by eating any sweets, I'm going to throw it up. Mm -hmm. Was that why I'm craving sugar? I just thought about it. I've been wanting something sweet, knowing that if I eat anything, any, if I eat chocolate, I'm throwing it up. It's either going to come out that way or the other way but I'm wanting it. Is it because I haven't had any protein or I'm not yeah. gaining enough protein? Yes, that's exactly, that's <sighs> exactly a very common thing that we see in bariatric patients. Yeah, because yeah, you we have to get that protein in and it has to be quality protein, so. That's weird, because I'm like, why do I, and if I eat it, I'm gonna be sick, but uh, I, I guess I'll buy some steaks tomorrow. Yeah. I haven't had any red meat. Okay. And you, and you know what, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> I just had a total hip replacement 
And it came from, uh, I had suffered from arthritis for over a year. And every time that I would put any type of, I really started changing my own eating habits because every time I would eat anything with sugar in it, I would be climbing the walls in pain at night. I would be in so much severe pain that I couldn't even sleep. I was in so much pain if I ate any sugar. <clears throat> also, I had to cut bread out of my diet. Oh, I can't eat that either. You know, I had to cut that out because it made me sick too. And so I, I know this, all the inflammatories, I had to just take them out of my, my diet. People used to ask, what can you eat? <laughs> you know? They wanted to bring me over something for dinner. And I would be saying, well, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. I can't eat this. But mm -hmm. the pain, my daughter used to tell me, it's not worth the pain. Mm -hmm. It's not worth the pain and it's not worth your quality of life. You should be vibrant and, you know, to be pain free. You know, we don't really know the value of, of health until we get sick, you know, that we can't do, you know, regular things that we used to do without any pain. So um, one piece of advice I would give you is not to focus on what you can't eat, focus on what you can eat. It's just like when I first became Muslim and then I, I told my family, you know, I can't um, be with y'all if you're going to be drinking and I, I can't have the pork. And they were like, well, you can't, you can't, you can't. But, you know, what is what well, Allah put haram for us is so small compared to everything that is halal. And it's the same thing. You have a condition where, you know, wheat is insulting your body and sugar because they're very inflammatory, right? Um, and so you want to honor that. So you don't want, it's not nourishing for you. It's not serving you, but so many other foods are nourishing for you. So focus on what you can eat. You know, we have to change the mentality. Like my husband, he's diabetic and he just went to Palestine and they all have this mentality. You can't eat this, you can't eat that, you can't eat that. So I told him, I said, you better go there and change that mentality. <laughs> Tell them I can eat this and this and all the delicious Palestinian food they're going to cook for him. You can eat so much of it. Don't have them thinking that I can't, I can't, oh, you poor thing, you can't, you can't, you can't. Yes, you can. You can eat so many things that are nourishing for you, right? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Sister Ayin, this was a very good, uh, informative uh, lecture. And inshallah, you know, I'm sure if you are able to, if you could come back next Wednesday and speak more about our dieting and our, put something together for us, because this, the women, as you can see from the questions, this is what we need to hear because they want to have a healthy, holistic, you know, Ramadan. So maybe if you're not busy, I know you're trying to get that PhD. Let me know if you can come back again next Wednesday, you know, with another, uh, you know, lecture for us on eating healthy and being holistic for Ramadan, inshallah. 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 Okay. It was a pleasure. And I'm so happy to be part of this Ramadan prep because like I said, we're, we're always you know, focused on how to be, you know, following the Quran and the Sunnah, and that's great, but we neglect our physical health too. So, um, you know, food is one part, it's a very important part, um, but it's just one part, our movement, our sleep, our stress, you know, all of that is, is makes up our, our holistic health also. So let's focus on movement and, and things like that also. Inshallah. inshallah. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in for, with us for living the Sunnah today. And inshallah, next Wednesday, we'll have another continuation of this uh, series. So, Supana Kala Humu Wa Bihamdika, Ashaduan Laila Haila Anta, Astaghfiruka Wa Tubu Ilaik. MashaAllah.